Hey up everyone, and I'm back with another tutorial. I've been meaning to get another one of these up for a while, but I was deliberating what kind of tutorial I should do next. Anyway, I finally decided to do one about how to create depth because this pool that I did a few months ago is the ideal candidate for demonstrating how I can create depth when painting fur. So today I'm just going to focus on one specific area at dog and it's going to be the ear that's on the furthest side. So it's on the screen right side, so the dog's left ear. There's a lot of different textures going on in ears. Some of it's a little bit clumped up and sort of curly and then in other areas it's more frizzy and separated. There's also a lot of different values going on between your shadows and your highlights so it's just an ideal area to focus on for this tutorial. So first thing as usual I'm just getting your paint onto paper and just covering that paper up and getting your darker values down. I don't focus on any detail at this point I'm just trying to get some colour onto paper get it covered up with paint as per usual and then when it's all covered up I'll start gradually focusing on your difference in values your highlights and your shadows and things like that and putting your highlights and shadows in places where they need to be so you're starting to get a little bit of impression of like your your shapes and your clumps of hair and things like that but it's still all quite impressionist and messy at minute it's just getting your your values in place and mapping them out you can just keep working this until you've got the range of values that you want, but you don't want to be going really light. As I've explained in other videos, I like to keep my lightest highlights until last. So always just keep it, everything a little bit darker than what your, your brightest highlights will be at the end. So at the moment what I'm doing is adding some darker areas in between these strands where your air clumps together in these curly strands that you can see especially near base at ear and also near side at face with cheek is against the ear and there's spaces between these clumps where light don't reach it so easily so it's a lot darker in between the clumps and I'm just adding some dark tones in them areas and this will also help them clumps to stand out a little bit better. Normally I'd be working from dark to light but during this modelling stage you can go a little bit back and forth because most of it's going to be covered up afterwards anyway when you put your detail and things on. You'll still see some influence from these darker sections even after you've put your detail on which is the old point and that's how you create your depth. And now I'm back to adding these impressions of air clumps and bear in mind at this stage you're really only focusing on where the actual general clumps of air are you're not really bothering about individual airs or any kind of detail i mean most of the time when you're painting it's about creating an illusion of hair rather than painting every single tiny little strand of air anyway you are going to be doing strands of air if you work in this style there's no getting around it but you wouldn't be trying to get every air in exactly the same place as what it is in reference photo You've just got to look at your reference photo and get an idea of the texture and then you've just got to apply that knowledge to your painting and you look at the reference photo for where your you know your, your bigger things are like your, your bigger clumps and things like that and try and get them you know in correct place as they are in reference photo but don't try to make every strand or every you know smaller strand that might have several layers in it don't try to make it all exactly the same as in your reference photo because it'll just end up looking really stiff and lifeless and it'll be really really you know monotonous for you to be able to try and produce that to try and replicate that because it's just too much hard work trying to get it all exactly the same you'd be driving yourself around twist so just try to get an idea of the actual general texture that's going on and try to understand it and then just apply that understanding to your painting and just paint and then just concentrate on where your, your larger clumps in general are because they're mainly what your eyes are going to see when you look at that painting from a few feet away and what have you anyway so when you've got everything in place like your clumps are air and your shadows that's in between them and your general difference in values and things like that you can start coming in with detail you can see that I'm working on these little strands of air coming down just below muzzle here and this air is quite curly here so I've just got to take it steady because I've got to paint curly lines you know to represent the airs that make up these clumps and I'm just starting off a little bit lighter than the paint that's underneath 
and then I'll be working lighter as I go along. And as I go along, I'll be decreasing the number of airs that I do in the lighter tones compared to the darker tones. And I'll also concentrate the lightest airs in middle of clump because that will bring it forward. And then the edges of the clump look like it, they're fading away, so it's like curving away from the viewer because they're a bit darker. Just like you'd use shading and highlights in order to create like a spherical effect if you were like painting a ball. You can also do it with these clumps of air so your brightest airs would be in the, the middle of the clump that is closest to you to bring it forward. And then as you get right sides of clump and it's going away from you, then you'd make it a little bit darker. So you don't want to completely cover up everything underneath either because... That's what's going to create all your depth. Still being able to see an impression of everything underneath that I've already painted on. And also, to make it look even more realistic, you don't want to keep all these strands too uniform either. You're always going to get little flyaway airs that sort of just go this way, that way and every other way. And they don't sort of stick to any one clump. They are just move in between. You'll get them crisscrossing across your shadowed areas and things like that. Again, don't go over the top with them because you don't want to be covering up everything underneath. It's a case of less is more. Another thing to remember when you're putting highlights on this kind of air, especially where it's got a lot of curls in it, you've got to remember that you're not going to get the same values along the, the full length of the curl. It's like when you've got a, a clump of air and it's got several curls going on. Some parts of them curls are going to be darker and some are going to be lighter. So where they curl curves in towards the dog, inwards away from you, it's more likely to be darker because there won't be as much light hitting that. And then when it curves away from the dog into all the ambient light and direct light and everything that's going on, then it's going to be a lot brighter on that crest, on that, that curve that curves outwards away from the dog. So that part at curl needs to be lighter than the part that curves inwards. And using these graduations in values will help to give the impression of actual curls in air as well. A lot of it's not just about the shapes that you're painting and drawing. A lot of it is about the values that you're using and the way that you, you work your lights and your shadows. Another thing you need to remember about air like this is that it's not solid clumps. They're not solid like, you know, metal or plastic or things like that. It's basically just an accumulation of airs and there's spaces between these strands of airs. So it's not solid in any sense. And the airs tend to be more concentrated at centre at clump and then a little bit more sparse on edges of clump and then you get some little frizzy airs and flyaway airs and what have you which, which are just separate from the main clump but still a part of it if you know what I mean. And in order to make the clumps look genuine you need to bear this in mind that it's going to be a little bit more dense with airs in centre and then a little bit less dense on your surface with some frizz and some flyaway airs that stick out and things like that front side. I'm thinking about doing some beginner videos where I show this kind of thing in a more simplified manner than, you know, working on an actual painting and just doing some simple diagrams and what have you. Aimed more at beginners because this is quite advanced stuff what I'm doing in these videos. So if that's something that you think could be interesting and helpful, then let me know in comments and I'll think more about doing stuff like that as well. So here I am with highlights and when you get to this stage you've got to make sure you don't go over the top with it because there's only going to be certain airs that catch the maximum amount of light or if you've got like a, a clump or a strander air it's it's going to be just certain parts of clump or, or certain parts of strander air that's going to catch you know these brightest highlights. It's not going to be like all over the place so you, you definitely want to be leaving quite a bit that's already underneath showing through. There's some really poofy clumps of air on this dog's ear, right up near where that cheekbone is, and they're going to be quite bright, and then there's other areas around it, and especially lower down on here where it's going to be quite a bit dark, so you don't want to put as many of these highlights in them areas. These clumps near dog's cheek are quite woolly, so you can put quite an eye concentration of bright tones on these to help get like a, a woolly appearance. On other areas, like the area just above them, right at the top edge of that ear, it's quite frizzy. So you can see more in way of like individual wiry looking airs in that, just like you can on that closest ear as well. You can see quite a lot of that on upper part of ear. So now moving on to these curly strands near base ear, you can see that I'm only adding highlights to certain parts of strands, namely areas where 
it's like curling outwards so it's going to be catching light more than the parts that strand where it's curling inwards. You've always got to remember that it's going to be a change in values that will help you to achieve the look of like curly air in this instance. So you don't want to be having the values exactly the same all the way down the the shaft of the airs or you know the, the clump of shafts. And just another reminder not to go overboard with your highlights in this area even more so than top of here where you've got more highlights you want to be leaving your darker gaps between your strands so that your strands can stand out and you can see quite a big gap in there in bottom of here as well where the, the fur just splits through and you don't want to be covering all of that up either there's going to be some airs in it and crossing over top of it and things like that but I'm not going to be covering it up because features like that give a real impression of depth so you don't want to be getting rid of them completely by covering them up with highlights. That's how you make it all flat. So anyway, I've been getting a lot of questions about the surface that I'm working on and things like that and what I do with paint before I apply it to paper and everything. Anyway, the paper I'm using is Fabriano Artistico Hot Press. £300 or 640 GSM, I think it is. Nice and thick so that you can apply water to it without it, you know, cockling and things like that. And it does hold up pretty well with this media. And it's nice and smooth, you know, which is good for doing this fine detail. I don't like any kind of texture. I don't like canvases and texture on them and things like that. I've, ne I've never used canvas except when I were at college and we had to do a bit of oil painting and things. But... I didn't like it then and I've never been interested in using it since so I always stick to using watercolour paper hot press. As for brushes I tend to use Winsor & Newton a lot but there have been some other ones that I've used as well. I use rigger brushes a lot for the hair details because they do hold a lot of paint with long bristles and I also use round brushes in various sizes uh, if you want to just apply plenty of paint in the beginning just to get paper covered up I might use a larger one or for applying background colour and things and then when you want to do smaller details I might use smaller ones sometimes really tiny ones like three knots and four knots and things like that. The paints I use are mostly at the moment um, Windsor & Newton Professional. I've also got some Liquitex and I've used a couple of those. My favourite black were actually a tube of Reeves acrylics. don't know whether everybody will have heard of that, but it's actually quite a cheap mech. And I just had them bought as a gift for Christmas one year. A tube of black and a tube of white. Now the white weren't very good. It were good as a mixing white for like when you just want to get some paint on background or on you know initial layers at dog but it were no good for like you know getting the highlights you know in your detail layer and things like that so I tend to stick to some of that you know is a little bit more professional you know for your whites but that black paint the, the Reeves black paint it were brilliant and I absolutely loved that it were really black and just went on really nice but I've just not been able to find it ever since and so I've had to go over to Liquitex but I still prefer that Reeves, even of it Liquitex. I tend to use soft bodied acrylics because this kind of work, it requires a little bit more flow in your paints. Yeah, everybody is better for your textured type paints where you might apply it with a knife or things like that. But things like what I'm doing, where you're doing lots of thin layers and tiny little details and things, your, your soft body is probably better. And yeah, I do apply water and I also have a flow improver that I use to make it a little bit easier as well. Doing these ear details I'm using a rigger brush and it's probably a, a size naught or something like that that I'm using for finer airs. I've also got like size two or three that also come in handy. As you might have seen in some of my other videos when I want to do really fine hairs and things like that I tend to flatten the bristles in paint so it's just flat on tip and then use one at corners at brush to get me fine hairs and that's how I do it. I don't leave it in a point, I tend to just flatten them into like a line end and then use one at corners and there are a couple of brushes where I've actually chopped some at bristles off so they're even thinner than what they were when I bought them. Sometimes it's just a case of experimenting with things and trying things out. I mean, a lot of stuff that I know, it's not come from watching somebody else or learning from somebody else. It's just experimenting and just trying this, that and the other. And that's how I've come up with some of these ideas. And that's just what you've got to do. Not stick too much to what you've seen other people do, but just try things for yourself. I mean, 
brushes that, that get old and warm, they can be used for all different manner of things. You know, you don't need to throw them out. You can use them for all different kinds of things. Be it against certain kinds of messy air textures or if you're doing backgrounds, you know, like trees and bushes and things like that, you can use them for all that kind of thing. And they come in handy for a lot of stuff if you just have a little play around and see what you can do with them. So meanwhile, whilst I've been blathering on about what it is I use and how I like to use it, you've probably noticed I've been putting this other colour on top of all my details that I've previously painted in. And what this is, is glazing. And you can use it in order to basically create more depth, get more layers. And what you do is you just get some paint, really thin it down so it's nice and transparent. Here I've probably used a little bit of black and a bit of yellow ochre, it looks of things. And then you apply it over top of your details so that it's transparent enough that you can still see your details underneath. But it, it applies some colour to them, it gives them a tone and it also darkens them a little bit. And then you just apply it to the certain areas where you want it. So I'm just putting it over various parts of ears where I want it to darken down a little bit. Obviously you can still see all little airs underneath and details that I've painted underneath prior to it because I've kept it nice and transparent. It's also useful to use this technique if you've gone a little bit overboard with your highlights and what have you and you've covered too much of your other work underneath up so it's you know lost its depth and what have you. You can just use glazing to darken areas down, get a bit of extra colour and tonality whilst you're at it. And then when you've done your glazing, you can then come back in over the top and apply some more highlights, but remembering this time not to go over the top like you did last time. Depending on how dark you want to go back down again with your glazing, you're better off working in layers. So just applying a nice transparent thin layer so that you can still see your other details underneath, letting that fully dry and then coming back in again with another layer just nice and transparent again and just building up on it gradually until you get the effect that you want and you should still be able to see your details through it. If you try to do it in one layer, it probably means that you'd have to make your paint a little bit too thick to go dark enough in one go and then you'd just be covering everything up underneath. When you first start applying your glazing, it will look a little bit patchy and weird, but then when you start putting your other details on top of that, it will start to look a lot better again. And it'll look better than before because you'll have extra tones and colours and things like that that you've introduced with your glazing layers. Sometimes it's easier to just work up with your white gradually. And then when you want to add some colour and things like that, you can just glaze it and then come back in over the top with more white details and then you've got all your colour and what have you showing from underneath. I mean, how good you want it to look all depends on how much time and effort you're willing to put into it. Realism like this is always going to be time consuming, it's always going to take time, although you can learn to speed your process up over years like I have done. People assume it takes me longer to do this kind of work than what it actually does, but it's only through practice that I've learned to speed things up a little bit. So now I'm back to adding details over top of that glazing layer, and you can see how the glazing has made them clumps really stand out a lot better now, because obviously I didn't apply any glazing to actual clumps, only a random, so they've now started to stand out and, and stick forward a lot better. And then I'm just adding extra highlights onto them to make them pop even more. And then also some little extra stray hairs and things like that, which just stick out from edge of ear. There'll be some like crossing over that little gap that you know near the bottom of the ear there where there's a there's a split in air there and there's a bit of a, a dark chasm in air, so to speak. <laughs> And then just a lot more around the edge of ear where it's catching a lot of light from above. And also on them little curly strands near the base of ear on inside, just under the chin there. You can keep applying more glazing layers and then going over the top of it again if you want. Whatever suits you and your individual situation. You can see that I'm just building up on these highlights again. Just putting these little wispy hairs and things like that on top. And just adding your final touches. I didn't need to do any more actual glazing on this occasion. But I have when I've been doing other paintings. So I think this is coming to a close now. I think it's looking the way that I want it to look. 
Here we are with the final photo, a few close-ups of the images that I took after I'd finished it. You can see a lot more detail in these photos than what we're showing up in them videos, but one day I will be able to get a better camera and start doing 4K video when I can afford it. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's uh, this tutorial come to an end. If you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. I do plan to do a lot more tutorials and if you've got any suggestions, then be sure to leave them in comments and I think that's going to do it for now so see you in my next video bye